so much for joining us this evening. Um, we're really happy to have you here. Um, we are eager to share some early thoughts regarding our facility planning process, and most importantly, to hear from you. Um, to hear some of your feedback and some of your early thoughts, and really just to get the discussion started with that, within our community. Um, the discussion around how can we improve our facilities to better reflect what we know our students need to be doing within our schools, learning within our schools, and what ultimately we hope our outcomes will be for our students. Um, so let me start with introductions. I'm Carrie from the School Amnesty Superintendent here in District 58. And I have with me here Todd Graybaugh, who is our Chief School Business Official, and Brad Paulson is here from our architect firm, White & Company, along with Amy Fuller. Uh, both Brad and Amy have been with uh, White & Company for a really long time, and White has been our architectural firm um, as a district for many, many years. Um, White oversaw the addition at Pierce Downer, as well as most recently the, the addition at Leicester Elementary School, so they have done a great job for us. They also are working very closely with District 99 with their um, facility improvement efforts right now, too. So we're very fortunate here in District 58 to have this collaboration as we prepare our students to enter District 99 um, and we think about what our facilities need to provide for our students. We also have this perspective of what, what will they be approaching when they enter District 99. And so we're really fortunate to have White & Company here with us. Um, Kevin Barto is here with us. He's our Director of Buildings and Grounds. And so he knows our facilities very, very well at this point and continues to support us. Uh, Jeff Newstead is our Assistant Director of Buildings and Grounds here in District 58. And um, Katie Hannigan is in the back. She also works in our business department, and so she's here to help us as well. And many of you know Megan Hewitt, who is our communications uh, coordinator. And Jessica Stewart is here with us as well. She's our assistant superintendent for special services. So we're happy to have a team here to meet with you this evening. So um, my job is to kind of kick off the event tonight, talk to you a little bit about our district and where we're at right now with our strategic plan, give you some background on what we've been starting to talk about, and then I'll introduce Amy, who will step up and talk a little bit about what our architects are exploring as they look at what our facility needs might be. Okay, so you have in your hands um, the presentation with a little more information, a little more depth than what you'll see on the slide. So we invite you to follow along and then also to take this packet with you as you go so that um, you can do a little more research if you'd like. All this information is also uploaded onto our facility planning site, plus a whole lot more information. So if you want to look back at some of the work that's been done over the last seven to ten years in terms of our facilities, all of that information has been uploaded onto our district website under the facility planning tab. And you can look back at the projects that we've been doing on an annual basis, some of the analyses that we've done to kind of lead up to this point where we are today, where we're really starting to contemplate more than maintenance of our buildings, but really that long-term vision of what do our buildings need to reflect for 21st century learning into the future, okay? So again, thank you for joining us. Um, tonight's visioning session, as I said, I will offer some district facts, go over our strategic plan and the timeline. We're really here to explore the why. Why are we looking at improving our facilities? Um, what do we need in order to improve our facilities? And how can we best reflect the vision of the district and the vision of our community at this point? Um, ultimately, the question is, can our buildings respond to and support the need for change and support that vision that we have for our District 58 students in the community? Um, and then, after you get kind of an overview of what we've been talking about, we're going to go to three different stations. And at each station, you'll have the opportunity to engage in conversation with each other and then to give us some feedback about what you've seen so far so that we can take that feedback. Our architects are, are, have been gathering this feedback from our facility planning council, from each of our faculty groups. We've gone to every single school building and met with our faculty groups, gone through many of the same um, kinds of activities with them. And they're in the process right now of pulling together all of this feedback for the first report that will go to the board in February, okay? So if you could advance. Um, this is just a little bit about our district. Most of you, um, I see many friendly faces around the crowd here, so most of you know much of, of these facts already, but we serve about 5,200 students. 
preschool all the way through eighth grade here in District 58. Our schools recently earned the highest ratings from ISBE. We have 11 exemplary schools and two commendable schools, and we are really, really proud of that. Those who have been in our district for a while know that we've been focused on growth, that academic achievement for our students, but also the growth for each and every student. And the state recently uh, reconfigured how they give these ratings out, and um, District 58 really performed quite well on those recent ratings. So it's something we're, we're super proud of. We have 11 elementary schools. Our elementary schools right now are pre-K, through sixth grade, and if you happen to be at Henry Puffer or at Indian Trail, you know that the preschool programs are housed there. We have two sites for our preschool program, and all of our other elementary schools serve students kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, we're a neighborhood school district, and so our schools really focus on um, connecting that community and really providing for the community that directly surrounds those neighborhood schools. Our, our elementary schools then feed into two separate middle schools that serve seventh and eighth grade before students move on to District 99. So our north side uh, middle school, which is Herrick, where we are tonight, um, all of our students here from Herrick move on to um, Downers Grove North High School, and all of our students from O'Neill go on to Downers Grove South High School, unless, of course, they, they choose to go to a private high school. Um, we also have two administrative buildings, and this is important to note because um, this has been a strength but also a challenge for our district for many years. Um, in, in so much as our administrative team is split between two buildings. So we have Longfellow here, which is in the Pierce Downer neighborhood. Um, that's an old school building that has been converted and houses our curriculum, um, our technology, our buildings and grounds team. Um, and we hold many of our professional development meetings there for our teachers. And then the other building is located down by Indian Trail Elementary School on 63rd Street. That's where my office is. That's where our personnel department is. That's where our special services department is, our communications department, and our business and finance team is also there at our administrative services center. So we have those two buildings. Um, both buildings are in need of some support, as, as many of our um, elementary schools are and our middle schools as well. Um, but both of those two buildings are, are aging quite rapidly. And so we, we do need to take a look not only at our school facilities, but also our, at our administrative centers as we look at our facility improvements. Um, and then, just to give you a few more tidbits of information about our district, about 637 full-time and part-time employees, and the pupil-to-teacher ratio is about 21 to 1. Okay, so that's just kind of a glimpse of our district overall. Many of you know that um, last year our district, our board, engaged in a big strategic planning process, and that process really was to go out to our community, go out to each of our faculties and our administrative team, and really evaluate how are we doing as a district? What are some of the successes we've accomplished? And what are some of the next things that we think are most important for us to really focus on as a district in order to best prepare our students and best serve our community? And so out of that strategic planning process, we maintained the mission and the vision of the district, um, but we identified three key areas, what we call three big ambitious goals that the district is really focused on right now for the next four years and accomplishing. And so those three goals, the, the center one, really our bread and butter as an educational institution, we are always focused on learning. Um, and so those goals really focus on strengthening our curriculum, increasing our rigor for our students, and making sure that we're supporting our teachers in their professional learning needs as well. Um, the the um, image to the left, which is our second goal, connecting the community, really focuses on communication, making sure that all stakeholders are aware of what we're working on within our district, well informed of the opportunities to become involved and engaged in our district, um, and really that we're connecting the community to help support what's happening within our schools. And then the third goal, and the goal we're here tonight to really focus most on is securing our future, and that goal focuses on our district finances and our district facilities. And really, um, the plans that we create right now are to build that future. What do our schools need to reflect um, in order to provide best for our 21st century learners? And how can we make sure that we are securing our finances enough to support not only the facilities, but all the important work that happens within our district and within our schools? And together, those three big ambitious goals are what we believe will help us to continue that pursuit of excellence in education that District 58 is known for. So these are, this is that goal three. So we have the first goal focused on student learning, the second goal focused on connecting the community, and then the third goal is focused on our facilities and our finance. And as we went through the strategic plan, there were some key areas 
that came out pretty, pretty clearly from our community um, in terms of the things that we really need to look at within our facilities as we build this plan and as we have opportunities to improve our facilities, these are the areas that we really want to focus on. The first, um, as you look at the key priorities, the first is improving um, and addressing our safety and security. So we know across the United States, safety and security within our schools is a, a critical concern for all of us for us as parents, for us as educators, um, and for our students as well. And so we want to make sure that as we look at improving our facilities and uh, making adjustments to our facilities that we're really thinking closely about um, safety and security within our schools. So that means um, what happens in the case of an emergency, how are we making sure that our staff and our students are protected within our schools, and what contingency plans do we have in place as well. So we'll spend a little time talking about that this evening. The second is providing air conditioning. Um, if you've been in our schools any time close to summer, you know that our schools can get quite warm. We have two schools that are open concept schools, El Sierra and Bel Air, and those schools have air conditioning. They were built and designed that way initially. But all of our other schools don't have air conditioning. We have some cooling stations in each of our schools, and sometimes for medical needs, we have to add air conditioning, but otherwise, um, this is something that our community has, has really called out for. Um, what are the costs associated with air conditioning? What are the options now with new technology to air condition our older schools? And, and ultimately, is this something that, that we want to pursue as a district? So each of these key priorities are things that we have, um, that the board has called upon us to develop a plan for, um, to consider what those costs are, what those opportunities are, and ultimately to put forward to the board a plan that would offer options for air conditioning, for safety, security, and then the next one is shifting to 6-8 middle schools. Um, there's a couple of things that this would provide for us. First of all, for our sixth grade students, it would provide them with that middle school um, learning experience, some of those opportunities that our sixth graders right now um, aren't accessing as sixth graders at our elementary schools, but might have access to if they moved over to the middle school. It also, we know that across our district, with the addition of our OK program, with the addition of special education and intervention and enrichment programs at our elementary schools, many of our elementary schools are really um, vying for space. And so by moving sixth grade over, we would certainly need to put additions onto both of our middle schools. We could not accomplish moving sixth grade over without putting additions onto each of the middle schools, but it would allow us to reconceptualize what's happening at our middle schools for our students at the middle school level, but also allow us at each of our elementary schools to really think about how we can best use the space in those schools as well. So as we think about 21st century learning, as we think about collaboration and communication and all of the um, making and doing types of learning activities that we want to provide for our students, we need to make sure that the space will allow for that. And so we want to look at that not only for our middle school students, but also for our elementary school students as well. So those are some things that, that we've been asked to really carefully consider. Along with that, we need to continue to look at our class size and our enrollment projections um, across the district. We're projected to be relatively flat at that 5,200 number of students, um, but we always see some growth and decline in different neighborhoods as our neighborhoods change and, and grow. And then finally, evaluating district facility use. You heard me speak earlier about Longfellow Center in our ASC. Those are our two central office facilities. Uh, the board has asked us to really evaluate the use of those facilities. Are they being used right now to their highest and best use, or should we be looking at an alternative there for those? those spaces and, and really for those services. Those services won't go away, but is that the best place to be providing those services? Okay, so that's really what the goal calls upon us to, to examine along with the finances to support not only facilities, but the teaching and learning that happens within our schools, okay? All right, so this is our timeline. And this timeline was developed by our Facility Planning Council, with, which is a stakeholder group um, representing teachers, administrators, parents, um, our architects uh, join us at that meeting. Um, and this team really came together to, to conceive how can we get to the place where we accomplish this goal? What does that timeline look like? So I'll walk you through this a little bit. Um, what I first want to point out is we started um, in 2018, so in this school year, and there were many, many steps that um, were initiated before we got here. We have been working on our facilities um, for probably forever, really, but in earnest over the last seven to ten years, we've really been um, strengthening what, what needs to happen to the core facility space, adding roofs, 
um, doing asbestos abatement, replacing floors, replacing windows, um, doing all the maintenance that's required in older buildings. Um, all of that was really, really necessary work that needed to be accomplished that leads us to today where we can start to think about what are the next things in education that our, that our facilities really need to be able to provide. Um, so we started um, it, with our step one, which is just really looking at establishing the why, and step two has kind of been happening concurrently, examining what do we have. We've done a lot of studies of our facilities, and um, so putting those two pieces together, we are preparing to present to the board in February um, of 2019 a report that really summarizes the outcomes of those two steps. So you'll see we are here um, with the yellow um, in January. Um, we had to revise the timeline just slightly to allow for the kinds of community events that we're hosting tonight and those that we held with our faculty as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I can kind of show you we are here and we're going to talk just a little bit about the prior steps before we jump into um, what the next steps will be. So let's see if we can read that. Um, many times uh, we are asked what kinds of work has been done in the past to our buildings that has led us to the place now where we're able to really think about the future of our buildings. And this is just a brief, high-level list of some of the things that have brought us to this point today. So again, I mentioned the roofs, and when you're talking about 13 schools plus two administrative centers, that's a lot of roof replacements that have needed to happen and a huge investment from our community into our schools. Um, looking at window replacements, um, we had our white company architects come in and do a comprehensive facility assessment in 2012. That assessment allowed us to really understand what our facilities needed in terms of maintenance and improvement um, of their core facility space, and now is helping to inform what the next opportunities might be within our district. We do 10, ten year life safety studies that is required of all schools, and again, that helps to inform um, the work that needs to be done within our schools. And then you'll see kind of down the list, we did an addition at Pierce Downer School, we recently did the addition at Leicester Elementary School, a lot of boiler work, a lot of um, tuck pointing, some playground and playground safety upgrades, um, that flooring and asbestos abatement, really critical work as well. So um, we now have our facilities in a place where we can start to think about what are the next opportunities. If we have the opportunity really to go out and ask our community for support of facility improvement, what does that need to look like and how can we best use that support to plan for the future of education here in District 58. So again, thinking about where we are now, um, the yellow, the, I'm sorry, the blue and the red boxes represent different months. So as you look forward, we're right between step one and step two. We're looking forward to that report that will go to the board in February. And then again, we'll see another report. Um, you'll see March and April, we're gathering more information. By May, there'll be another report about what do we want to, what do we want as a community? What do we think best serves our students here in District 58 and our community as a whole? And then ultimately, our push right now is to get to that June date where we're presenting the board with a facility master plan. And basically at that point, we are showing the board, here are some options to address some of these areas of concern that the community has called out and that the board has directed the administrative team to plan around. Um, if we present that in June, then the board will have the summer months to really um, dissect that report and better understand that. Meanwhile, the administrative team will be evaluating the financial options to support that plan. And then we'll come back in August um, and present those financing options to support the plan, ultimately leading up to um, what, what would be community endorsement of the board plan. Um, in December, we would be asking the board to um, consider that and then in the future, possibly in March, we would be asking the community for support of that plan if we get to that point, okay? So there's a lot of steps and many, many more opportunities for the community to be engaged, but we're really glad to have you here tonight because we want to start this conversation here, but also we hope that you can then be our ambassadors out to the community to share some of this information and help the community understand some of these ideas that we're talking about as well. Todd, if you could just kind of flip through, um, this is the today and immediate future, we're aiming for that June date, and then ultimately when we get to August, and then to December, the board will need to make some decisions about whether or not this is a plan that they can support for the long term and, and a plan that they want to go out to the community 
with. Okay, that's really exciting, but really the more exciting thing is to start to think about what does 21st century learning look like in our schools right now. Um, and so this is an image that um, we've shown at each one of these events when we've talked to our faculty, when we've talked to the FPC. Um, what used to be um, education within our classrooms, a teacher kind of sitting or standing in front of a, a group of students sitting at desks, listening to the teacher. Um, education very consistently when you and I were maybe in school, that's what we experience. What now our students experience is much more flexible, much more collaborative. There's a whole lot more group work. There's a whole lot more making and doing and doing over again. And we need to make sure that our, our classroom environments can support that type of learning. So when we think about what was yesterday and what we think about today and tomorrow, um, even this picture on the right sometimes I think um, that happens sometimes, but even more so than that, when you walk into our schools, you often see students all over the classroom working in lots of small groups, working in lots of flexible ways. Um, and we want to make sure that the furniture, the classrooms, the technology, the curriculum really can support that kind of work. So this is our new reality. And, um, as much as we sometimes will debate technology infused within the classroom, the reality is for our students, it is the world that they live in right now. Our third graders um, are the same age as an iPad, so all of our students really, their entire lives have, have technology all around them and we need to figure out how to support them in using that technology appropriately and support them in, in making sure that they're having access to technology that really supports the kind of learning and doing that that we know will support their future careers in their future education as well. So if you flip to the next one, um, as we've gone around and been talking with our teachers, uh, we've shown them a video to kind of get them thinking about what education looks like today. Of course, our teachers know this, um, but sometimes it's helpful to just um, get them thinking a little bit, and we hope this video might get you thinking a little bit too about what education looks like um, within a 21st century classroom. So. We're going to play this. I'll step aside while it plays. It's supposed to have good music, but it's not. <laughs> and best practices in 21st century learning, there's, there's four key areas that we talk a lot about. I think it's on the next slide. There you go, go forward. Um, so these are the four things that the U.S. government, as they did their study, um, and really looked at the skills that our students need in order to be successful in the future. These are those four areas. And the first is creativity, um, which refers to the ability to see what's not there 
and make something happen. And so as we think about the work world that we all are in, um, what research has found is by 2020, creativity will be the third most important work skill after complex problem solving and critical thinking. So that creativity we need to infuse within every single classroom. It's not just art time and music time, but it really is throughout their classroom environment and making sure that they have those opportunities. Collaboration is the second, the ability to work effectively with others, including those from diverse groups and with opposing points of view. And 83% of employers seek out indicators that candidates are able to work in a team. And so that collaboration, those flexible environments, those small group learning opportunities really, really are important for our students. Critical thinking, we know the ability to make decisions, solve problems, and take action is appropriate. 73.3% of business executives who hold identified critical thinking as a priority for employee development, talent management, and succession planning. And then finally, communication is the ability to synthesize and transmit your ideas both in written and oral formats. In 95% of employers ranked oral communication as the most important applied skill for four-year college graduates. These are the skills that we need to be supporting within our students. These are the skills that our teachers are working to support each and every day. And we need to make sure that if we have the opportunity to improve our facilities, that we're improving them in ways that support this type of learning and skill development. So 65% of children entering primary school today will ultimately end up working in completely new job types that don't yet exist. So we are preparing them in much the same way as the video showed. We are preparing them for a future that we don't yet know. And so we have to make sure that the learning environment and the learning opportunities are as dynamic as that world is that they're approaching. And so as we think about the, go ahead, Todd. <laughs> As we think about that, those skills and those knowledge and that new balance, we really need to make sure that our buildings are reflecting that. And so if we have the opportunity to make improvements, these are the things that we're talking about. Um, so I will introduce Amy, who's going to talk through some of the things that school architects are looking at. As they're building new buildings and renovating older buildings, um, there's eight key things that they're looking for. So Amy and Brad. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm actually a current resident of Downers Grove, as well as working as the uh, lead architect in District 99, and I'm here with Brad Paulson. And yeah, she's a Downers Grove South graduate. I am. <laughs> so, um, like Amy said, my name is Brad Paulson, and I'm excited to be here too. Amy and I are working, working together on this. And when we look at buildings, when we look at school buildings that are positioned for and preparing students for the future, we really look at eight core areas that are really the central ingredients of what makes a modern learning environment and best supports the teacher's ability to nurture those skills. So the first one is really the classroom. Everything happens in the classroom. That's the core learning space. The classrooms are changing. Flexibility, uh, the ability for groups to get together in small groups, large groups, uh, change on the dime. The furniture is so critical to this, different scales, different levels of comfort for different age groups of students. It's really what enables the teacher to change the learning experience on a, on a momentary basis. We also look at areas beyond the classroom, four walls of the classroom, and uh, areas of collaboration, spaces for small group learning, and for, for students to teach other students. And having that opportunity with technology and, and places to kind of go and huddle and be able to work together in a group, um, as well as having transparency for a sense of su uh, uh, supervision by teachers. And technology is just not in the classroom or in the space outside of the classroom. We're actually looking for larger spaces. Technology is mobile. You're no longer com combined to a desktop. Come up find to a desktop at a desk in a computer lab. It's large group space with lots of different types of furniture where kids can work in small groups, can work together, large groups, multiple classes can, can come together to leverage the use of technology in different types of space. Your library, your library today isn't um, what maybe you or I have gone to school with. It's not the necessarily the, the quiet study place. I mean, there's multitude of activities that happen in libraries today, um, whether it be group learning or activities, um, as well as the, the research and, and looking up things with the use of technology. So maker spaces, uh, STEM, are probably two of the biggest, I would say, uh, current movements within schools right now in terms of how curriculum is changing, 
how kids learn, uh, learning by making things, by testing, uh, testing theories. Uh, Dr. Kremsblad mentioned by coming over a key, a key to learning is to try to figure out how to fail and move forward with fail, uh, fail forward in the process of, of, of using all the different elements of the things you learn in school in one individual project-based learning example. Aside from teaching and learning, student comfort and staff comfort is also important. Um, looking at daylight, allowing daylight to penetrate through spaces, um, looking at air quality within, within the built environment and what that happens, and engaging that space both um, in the classroom as well as that transparency and seeing through the, the classroom of what, and putting learning on display. And social learning uh, and the dining experience that students have is one of the biggest focuses right now. How many people have been, can reflect back to their experience sitting at the big long tables with eight to 12 people on each side, and you're staring at the same person every 50 minutes, you know, or 25 minutes every day of the week. So the whole experience of dining is changing. Uh, the furniture is changing to support that social interaction, talking about what happened in class and try to create better connections. Social and emotional learning is one of the biggest conversations in education, and that experience in the cafeteria or the dining space is one of those elements that we're seeing schools really uh, move towards to help um, kind of support that conversation and those relationships with other students and teachers. And the idea of promoting um, healthy lifestyles and, and looking at um, and wellness spaces Within, within your built environment. So those are the kind of the eight core types of spaces and, and, and environments that we look for. So what we want to do right now is uh, break up into different types of different activities. We're thinking we should do two activities, okay. nine, nine groups of piece. We were gonna break up into three groups and you have a little card, colored card, which is kind of irrelevant now. <laughs> but it was a good plan. Uh, so what we're going to do is maybe break up like the first two rows and then the last two rows go to this section and then the, the back portion of the room go to these sections and here's what we're going to do so in these first sections. Two rows so first here first, and second two rows go first, to there? Yeah, first three there. rows go to here, back to that <coughs> here. So we want about nine people on each. So let us explain to you what's going to happen in, uh, in these different, different activities. So the first thing, when you come over to the activity over here, um, we're going to be focusing on District 58. It's kind of the core uh, areas that they're looking to consider, the key priorities that are up for consideration. Safety and security, student comfort, and that 6-8 middle school versus having a K-5 grade center. And at that, there's a series of boards set up. Each person or each group will uh, be visiting two out of the four boards set up. Um, and the envelope that you were given at the beginning has a set of dots. There's ten dots um, that you will be using per board. So you'll have three green dots, which we're considering kind of high priorities. What do you consider? There's no right answer, by the way, when you read these <laughs> questions. Um, just kind of what in, uh, resonates with you when you're reading the, the priority statements. Um, we're going to ask that you discuss it with your group but vote individually. So the green, three green dots are your high priorities, the ye three yellow dots are kind of a medium priority, and the um, three red dots are your low priority. Everyone has one blue dot per board, and that blue dot is kind of, this is, is the highest priority, kind of something above and beyond that you can't see without. And, and so these boards are actually broken up into two pieces. So these two pairs of boards over here, cover the same groups of topics, and these two boards over here cover the same groups. So you don't have to go back and forth. Just pick a lane. We'll help you. Yeah, yeah we'll, help. we'll help you navigate the, the traffic. Yes, yeah, question. If these are the only three options that are being considered at all for facility improvements. I mean, because we're at Highland, and I, that's not up for consideration at all in the expansion onto our school. Is that what I'm to understand by this? So we haven't even no, gotten haven't. into building per se. This is all visioning pieces. I think you'll see when you get to the different pieces, there's it's a it's a much higher. We're we're not there yet with individual okay. buildings. We're at a much higher level right now. Okay. The envisioning process as to what our 
core beliefs and priorities and structures for the district overall. Um, that piece and what that will be is yet to come. You know, kind of looking at the timelines, you know, we're at the beginning stage of this process. So there'll be more about, you know, as, as we get into more detail and find things later on. We're trying to understand priorities. What, what issues resonate the most? It's just uh, kind of to tap on what you're saying, though, is just because the headings of all these are really just about six grade vacating and moving on to adding some of the needs. So we're, we're talking about it, it just doesn't seem that. There's parts of it. There's about six, there's, there's aspects of that. There's also safety and security and some other pieces. And there's a couple other, that's, that's activity A. We have activity B and C, okay. too, that are coming. And so it's not all just about 6-8. It's encompassing. There's a group of questions on the boards that have to deal with what happens at the elementary school levels. Now, in that back corner, you're going to go to the tables. There's a sheet of paper with 10, 10 items on the sheet. Uh, these are statements that have resonated the most with the facility planning group, with the teachers. So now we're looking to get your input. So there's, there's a, uh, these, these pages here. We would like you to discuss them as a group at your table for about six, seven, eight minutes. And then individually, you can prioritize which ones, one through 10, one being the uh, most essential, 10 being the least essential. Um, we're gonna score those and rate those uh, priority statements. There's also room at the bottom of this list if there's something else that you want us to think about that we haven't considered, feel free to write it out. There's no right or wrong answers here. We want you to discuss as a group and then prioritize individual. And then yes, and then in the last activity, um, you'll be working at tables with your, with your individual groups and discussing kind of three questions. What excites you about this whole process? what concerns you, and what more do you need to know? And from there, so we want to thank you very much for your time because we're going to basically work in 15 minute increments and then after that you guys are free okay. to go. So if you need more information, the district does have a website and it's in your packets as well um, uh, uh, for more information online to go read about the project. And, so, on, and right, so on that website, one, this presentation will be posted out there. <coughs> Two, all the other presentations that have been done to date as well as a lot of the information on previous work and so forth uh, is also listed uh, on, on that site as well. So, so we're going to go two groups here, and then the, those two groups will move over here, and then we'll rotate back over here. Right, so that group is going to the top 10 list. <laughs> 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 